Well, once again, everybody, I want to welcome you to our podcast tonight. I've got my dear friend Jack Dunn with me, and uh, this is going to be a powerful, powerful podcast. Last week, we were talking about memories, and as we talked about where long-term memories were stored and how short-term memories uh, work and how there's a transition from short-term to long-term memory and how those short-term memories had to be meaningful and impactful uh, to be transitioned from short term to long term uh, in all of that significance about memories and how memories play an important part in the process of change in th- the uniqueness of memories in the process of our development led us to some very important and significant um, Dynamics, especially the seven sins of memory. And eventually we got to the point where we talked about memories that are called flashball memories. And flashball memories, if you remember, are those memories that are detailed recollections of when and where we heard about shocking events that really get encoded in our brain that have a lot of emotional attachment. And we talked about how those emotional attachments really get imprinted and encoded in the amygdala. And some of those memories are very painful. And they prevent us from moving forward. They prevent us from making needed changes. And they prevent us from uh, processing things that we need to process and surrender and letting go. And they get in the way of us really making significant changes in our lives so that we can experience the successes, achieve the goals, and have the desired outcomes that we really are looking for. So I've invited my good friend, Jack Dunn, who's a licensed clinical social worker and uh, is a clinical therapist and who has been trained in hypnotherapists and therapy and who's worked with clients who have struggled with recovering some of their memories and processing these memories, these things, so that they can get past them and move on. And now, I want to make it clear, and I've asked him to help us with this so that he can make it even better, more understanding that recovering from a memory and the difference between an implanted false memory so that we can be healthy and achieve those desired outcomes. So I'm going to turn the majority of tonight over to him and let him just jump in here 
and I'm going to try not to interrupt him, which he knows I do quite well, and uh, let him open up. And if you have questions, just just uh, jump in here, type them out, uh, and uh, I'll ask him on your behalf. So, Jack, welcome to the show, and I'm going to turn it over to you and share your thoughts about memory and recovery memory and how uh, how we can overcome some of those things we hang on to and teach us. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me back. Um, I get excited about hypnosis. It's my favorite intervention to do uh, in my practice. Um, hypnosis has some good and bad reputation. Uh, the bad reputation comes a lot from stage hypnosis where people forget their names and quack like a duck and do all sorts of weird things to make the audience laugh. Um, unfortunately, most of the people that are up on stage are not in a trance state and are by nature exhibitionists and like to have that attention and the audience response and all of that kind of thing. So if you're looking at hypnosis from uh, the guy that came to your high school and, and made uh, the little kid in your class uh, act like uh, Bill Cosby, that's not what we do in hypnotherapy. Hypnosis or trance state is a very natural state. It's actually alpha wave state in your brain. It's the same state that you're in just before you drop off to sleep at night. It's that state where you feel like you're still awake, but somebody tells you you're snoring. And uh, it's, it's a very peaceful and, and natural state to be in. Uh, the hypnotherapist really doesn't have control over your brain function. That's still all, totally up to you. And uh, so uh, generally, if the hypnotherapist were to give you a suggestion that was innately against your moral principles, you'd probably just wake up and not continue in the trance state. Um, if you get a good ethical uh, hypnotherapist, they will be not searching for anything specifically when it comes to memories. If you come in and say, hey, you know, I had this memory that when I was a little kid, um, I was locked in a closet and, and I was scared and it was dark or whatever, we might go back and explore that to see if, you know, did that happen? Uh, was it uh, just something that happened? You got in the closet, the door got shut, you couldn't get out. Your mom didn't hear you screaming for a while, or was it something that maybe was not uh, something that um, you really want to deal with at the time? Um, memory is a really tricky thing. It's something that we really still don't know a lot about. And, and Mark, in his uh, last podcast last week, talked about these flashbulb moments that we have where uh, we think that we have a memory of something, but we're not real sure, we're not clear. Um, most of those are fragmentary parts of our memory. We really don't um, hold memories of, you know, severe things. Uh, you may have a very... Uh, a vivid memory of where you were and what you were doing when you heard about the uh, crashes in the World Trade Center on 9-11. Or for some of us older folks, you may remember where you were when President Kennedy was assassinated, and you remember those very vividly. But if you go back to other people and talk to them about the incidents, they will remember it totally differently than you did. And that's kind of the problem with memory. We have a narrow focus of, of how it uh, stays in our mind. And uh, that's why 
is becoming a very uh, prominent uh, in uh, court cases where they are testing the validity of eyewitness accounts because if a police officer finds five witnesses in an accident, say, uh, he may get five different versions of what happened, and none of them may even be alike. So that's just how our memories are different and how they work. And uh, so when I have gone back and helped people recover memories, I try to make it as generic a process as I possibly can so that I'm not asking leading questions or giving them information that may spark something that's not really there. So does that make sense to everybody? Well, it certainly makes sense to me, and I, and I appreciate you really helping clarify the process because I want people to understand that, uh, and I tried to um, articulate that last week, that we, we come away, and that's one of the faulty aspects with memory. What I may recall uh, in an experience, uh, I think I used my sister Sherry as an example, uh, I have to check in with her because I'm not sure the way I remember it is the way it actually was. Right. And, and her experience may be a totally different experience than what I recall it was. And, uh, and sometimes I question my memory about the experience. And I appreciate you bringing up that the officer example of five different people because this is so true. Um, we all have and can hear the same speaker in, giving a speech and come away with five different points of view of what was said in that speech, even though we heard the same words. Right. And uh, your experience with the event uh, also charges emotions that affect the way the memory is processed in your brain also. So... Memory is one of those things that's really kind of a touchy thing. Um, I'm not saying that, that if you are having those kind of memories that they're wrong and they're bad or whatever. I think that you just need to be careful um, how you go about getting the information through that. Hypnosis is definitely one process that can do it, and, and I've had success more in resolving trauma than actually, you know, identifying all of the details of the event. So um, it depends on what you're looking for. Um, an example that I give on, and people may disagree with me on this, but two of the things that I, I really question as a, as a therapist and also as a hypnotherapist are people who report being uh, abused in satanic rituals and uh, are also uh, saying that um, they are um, remembering past lives. There is no empirical evidence yet to prove that we have past lives, uh, it just isn't there. Uh, if you find somebody that believes that and is willing to take you through that and you believe that, fine, go, go with it. But uh, scientifically, it's not anything that uh, is provable at this point. As far as satanic rituals, the evidence in research right now is that maybe one-tenth of one percent of people who are actually ritually abused by a cult or, or something like that. So it's not a very high number. So if you go to a therapist who's saying that, yeah, I have this person or that person to have found ritual abuse in their lives, 
My guess is that there may be some uh, leading of the of the client and and maybe an agenda on the part of the therapist that uh, would produce that because it's not a very common event. In fact, it's very very rare. Yeah. So those are things that I would definitely look for if if you've got a memory you want to pursue and. Um, you know, a lot of things too. You got to remember, um, our our brain has the capacity to pick up stuff that we're consciously not aware of. So, say you go to a movie and the people behind you keep talking, you may pick up on their conversation and remember that long after you remember what was in the movie. Yeah, and that's in, excuse me, Jack, uh, if I may. That that's sure. that's one of the things that we talked about as one of the seven sins of memory. It was suggestibility, and the power that suggestibility tends to incorporate into our memories misleading information from external sources. And, and Karen Karen wrote uh, in in a message here as you were talking that a psychologist told her that her memories may not be the same as her sister's. Uh, and that she may have been much more sensitive than her sisters, and so she would view experiences differently. What's your thoughts about that? Well, I think that uh, that psychologist is right on track. Um, I can sit with my brother and remember stuff that happened at home, and he doesn't remember it the same way that I do. Uh, that's that's just because we as individuals, that focus on ourselves and how it relates to us. Sure, sure. So I didn't mean to interrupt you, but you keep going, if you will. Yeah, it's, it's very common, and, and it goes back to the eyewitness uh, stuff. I can be in a room doing therapy with a client, and they will experience the interaction that we've had totally different than I did. They may be giving me something out of our interaction that I'm not. And that's just part of being human. We can't avoid that. But uh, telling her that her sister would see things differently is absolutely true. Um, none of us will remember the same thing. And unfortunately, um, one of the things that, that aggravates a lot of people as parents get older is that parents won't remember things the same way we do. And what we thought was a horribly strict environment, our parents thought was just good parenting. So, you know, those kind of things are things that have to be taken into consideration when we're talking about memory recall. Sure. So, so Jack, if you will, can you delve into the false memory syndrome a little bit more deeper? Yeah. False memory syndrome is basically... Uh, a memory that you have that isn't true. And I, I have no idea how these memories form in our minds. Um, sometimes, you know, I would think that the uh, presence of multimedia presentations in our life from video games to movies to television to all of the stuff that inundates our lives um, will spark something in us and we may literally have a memory about something traumatic that actually really didn't happen. Um, what I, I have a personal example of that. Um, I, uh, I got uh, burnt with a sparkler when I was about five years old. And I've got a nice scar on my upper thigh to remember it by. But I remember that my brother and I were out in lawn chairs uh, fooling around with sparklers. My me memory is somehow a spark lit my pajamas on fire, which I was wearing at the time. And uh, my brother's recollection the last time that I talked to him was that I was sitting on his lap and maybe the sparkler dropped in my lap. So even though I still have the traumatic memory of being burned and I stay away from sparklers to this day, 
I still, I'm not sure that I know what happened to cause that. And I'm not sure going back and having hypnosis is going to make me want to know any more than I already do. So, <laughs> Okay. And so in, in your opinion, in your experience in working with clients through hypnotherapy, when you work with these individuals and help them go through the process of recovering a memory so that they can get past something that may be painful to them, so they can go through the process of making necessary changes for their well-being. What has that been like for you and for them? I think the first thing you need to do is make sure that your hypnotherapist is a licensed therapist. There are a lot of people out there that, that put up a shingle to do hypnotherapy that don't have the training for therapy. Once you find that memory, what your process and your job as a therapist is, is to help heal the trauma that's involved in that memory. And so you need to be able to do cognitive behavioral therapy. You need to do dialectical behavioral therapy. You need to be able to do transactional analysis to analyze all of these different aspects of the memory and help the person move on from the trauma. So really, uh, Memory work in in my practice has been to resolve and heal trauma. Uh, I really don't care if you can remember all of the details of that memory. What I want to do is heal the hurt that keeps interfering with the functioning of your life and is causing your depression, is causing your anxiety, is causing you to lose sleep. Those are the things that I want to focus on and help you get over. And you need a very good background in the fundamentals of psychotherapy to be able to do that. So if I may, to, to help our listening audience, when, when you talk about helping healing trauma, do you put an age-related um, Period, time period on that, how far back are we talking about when we're dealing with trauma? Well, I think that, uh, you know, we, we um, sometimes are able to have memories from when we're real small. Most of us can remember back to when we were four or five, generally. Uh, that's mainly because our brain is maturing at the time and, and um, is not fully functioning the way that an adult brain would as you grow up. Uh, I have been able with clients to go back as far as maybe kindergarten age uh, and, and resolve some issues that way. Uh, I think that people who are having memories that involve their uh, late childhood and adolescence are probably able to recover a little more than if you're younger. Uh, obviously, adult memories probably would be the, the most likely to be something that they would be able to remember. Um, I think it just depends on the developmental level of the person's brain at the time that the incident happened and what they would be able to remember. I very rarely go looking for, oh yeah, my mother um, did this and that when she was changing my diapers or whatever, you know, that. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, mean, I, yeah. I, I definitely don't think that you can remember that far back. Yeah, uh, so so let me, let me tell you an experiment I did in my psychology classes. I asked uh, my students, how far back do you remember? Uh, and you know, the, the outcome doesn't shock me. It doesn't surprise me. Uh, it, some of them remembered really early years of their childhood uh, experiences. Most were well beyond their toddler years before they could recall. Uh, like, I'm, I'm one person, I don't remember much of my childhood at all. And I don't know that there was anything really traumatizing that happened. It, it, it just doesn't seem to me like there is anything significant that I encoded in my childhood 
or it was just such a frightening experience growing up in the area that I grew up that I don't want to remember those early childhood experiences. Um, and so how common is that that you run into in your practice? Part of the reason, I think, for what you're saying is that our our mind, whatever the mind is, the you know, we know that our brain functions on electricity and chemicals and and that's how everything is worked, but we really don't know what the mind is. And I think that there is a safety mechanism in our mind somewhere that allows us to not remember some things. Um, and it's a safety mechanism. Um, I, I don't know that for sure, because like I say, there's no way to actually know what's going on in our minds at any given particular point. We don't have the tools yet to, to measure those things. Um, but most of the things that I, I have dealt with uh, a lot were abusive parents and the parents truly were abusive. And uh, some of the things that I have dealt with, uh, especially with adolescent girls, is um, the trauma of, of any kind of sexual encounter that was unwanted on their part. So um, it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, a molestation, but it could be uh, getting stuck in a fire drill in an elevator or something like that where it's too close for comfort, that kind of thing. Um, I don't know whether that answered your question or not, but... Well, yeah, I think, I, 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 and I'm in agreement with you, and that's what we talked about. Uh, the brain does have, or seems to have some type of defensive mechanism that protects us uh, uh, from those types of incidents that... It's there for a reason, whether that's to prevent us from overwhelming us or anxieties or fears early in childhood during those developmental years or whatever it may be. Uh, and it's, you know, uh, I often joke that here I am in ninth grade and there's a picture of me and I still look like I'm in elementary school. And, and I joke about third graders coming over to the high school and beating me up and going back to elementary school and saying, I beat up a ninth grader, it, you know, and it's, uh, it's, it, it was my reality because I was just a small child and, you know, and, and I grew up in a very unsafe environment. But that's part of what we experience in our brains. As you said, we haven't yet decided in uh, medicine or in psychology what really the mind is. We haven't really fully defined what memory is because these are still the sciences that we're discovering. And probably we will continue to redefine those definitions as we continue to study and discover. And I think that's a fascinating uh, development. Uh, I, I think it goes to, you know, uh, Rene Descartes hundreds of years ago uh, in... Uh, Explaining existence says, I think, therefore, I am. Mm -hmm. And I'm starting to be of the opinion, I remember, therefore, I am. Sure. You know, that's part of my personality, it's part of my existence, the memories that I store. And some are good and some are bad, and that's just kind of how life is. Yeah, and I think, I think the biggest part for us uh, is that we, because of memories, and because of things that we've stored, I think we become fearful that we are stuck in that mindset or that memory set and we can't move past it. And that's what I want the audience to know. We can. We can right. overcome. We can uh, go past things that we've held on that says, I am this or I am that, and those things are not who we are. We're greater than that, we were designed greater than that, and we do not have to be stuck in that mindset. My mistakes are my mistakes, my mistakes are not who I am. And so it's important for us to learn 
that we don't have to be confined by those past memories and right. that we have the potential of becoming great and achieving our goals and achieving successes and the it be, it seeing ourselves in our mind's eye uh, of that vision of success that we want to be and achieving that. And that's the important part. So how would you conclude that? I think I would include, conclude by saying um, hypnosis is a wonderful tool for therapeutic uh, reasons. Um, if you would like to explore memory, just be careful of picking a therapist who is not only a hypnotherapist, but also a trained psychotherapist. And if there are memories that you want to explore and find more out about, go for it. If you want to forget stuff, forget it. You know, um, it's not worth the rest of your life to harbor something that impedes your ability to be happy. Right. It's just not. Right. Yeah, and the reality is we don't live long enough to hang on to this forever. And we got to see a vision of ourselves progressing and moving on and overcoming and achieving. And I think that part's important. Well, Jack, our, our 30 minutes are up, and I so appreciate you, and I hope to bring you back again. Uh but before I let you go, I, I want to say to my audience tonight, uh, folks, I'm going to have to step back for a couple months. And so this is going to be my last podcast for this year. Um, there's some things I need to take care of uh, as far as uh, health issues are concerned. Uh, nothing that you need to be overly concerned about, but... Um, it's uh, requiring my attention and my focus, and I need to give that time and energy. Uh, so I'm going to step away from the podcast. We're going to come back in January. Uh, we're going to revamp, uh, maybe even look at a different time slot. Uh, I do want to make you aware that uh, AJ, my son's finally got the book cover done. Uh, my new book that will be coming out, and it's titled uh, Before Birth and After Death, Journeys Beyond the Bell and Back. Uh, so look at that. That will be coming out in the next few weeks. Uh, I'm excited about it. It's uh, experiences uh, that are related to pre-mortal life and journeys in the spirit world and back. And so uh, it's, uh, it's a powerful experience. True related stories. Uh, I'm uh, excited because some of you have contributed your own personal experiences to that book, and I appreciate that. And so uh, I'm signing off for now. Uh, I'm going to take a couple months and get some things hopefully worked out with my doctor, and uh, I'll be back uh, in January. So thank you, and God bless, and uh, we'll have Jack back, and we'll continue to work on these issues together. So think positive. Have greater vision for yourself and enjoy the holiday seasons and continue to work in achieving the changes that you want in your life and be successful. Thank you.